Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and great news for 2025 because I've just released my version of the Black Belt Handbook with the mini tab screenshots in. So what you've now got is 500 pages of fantastic advice on how to transform your process physics and make your processes do what you want them to do. But you've also got step-by-step -step screenshot advice, there's some there, on how to use all the great statistical analysis in Minitab to conduct your process improvement projects. The Black Belt Handbook, the Minitab edition is out now. I want you to click on the link below Go to lulu.com and buy your copy right now. Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and in this video newsletter what we're going to talk about is the possible KPI in low volume manufacturing in terms of quality. What quality KPI should you use? So let's stick that on the board. We're going to talk your quality KPI. And I'm gonna give you a few choices. We'll talk about how they'll work, how they might not work. And this is in relation to a question that I'd been asked uh, by one of my viewers just recently. So we're just gonna drop it in a video. So of course, you got a quality KPI. The, the, the obvious one to use is people go defect rate. Defect rate, nice and simple. You do an end of line test, you go pass fail, and they go defect rate. Okay, so that's the first one. Then they go defects per million. Now that usually is customer facing. So usually we do that with customer returns. So it's a customer facing measure that you tend to use. You don't tend to use that internally often. Why do you tend to use defects per million? Because, and this is especially true, I wouldn't say you do this in low volume situations, but high volume. When you're making high volume, let's say you make a million cars in a year, this number is the number of pissed off customers you've got. So if you've got 10,000 defects in a million, that's 10,000 assassins going around the country saying, oh my God, have you driven one of those cars recently? They are terrible. So that's especially good in high volume, especially good customer facing. So what else have we got? The next one, and this is the one I'm gonna recommend for low volume, is mean time to failure mean time to failure okay so we'll come back we'll come back to mean time to failure in a second i'm going to suggest replacing this with this in low volume and finally the last one and this is for complex products and i would say it's defects per unit produced defects per unit now this one I would say is for complex assemblies. Okay, so if you make something with 20,000 parts in it, the likelihood is you're gonna make mistakes almost in every unit you make. So of course, if you use defect rate, your pass fail would be 100% failure. It's no use to you, is it, as a KPI? You know, the KPI is supposed to be an indicator of performance. Is your performance stable? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Well, if all you ever see is 100% failures, that's not gonna be very helpful as a KPI. So if you make something that's complicated, um, you know, once upon a time, the car industry potentially might have used defects per unit when they made lots of mistakes. In a car assembly plant today, should they get lots of defects? Well, 
Not, not really. I, I, I am spent a lot of time in the, the car industry to know what the internal defect rate looks like. But anyway, defects per units produced is a great one for complicated assemblies where you're nearly always guaranteed to make at least one mistake per unit and therefore everything is a fail. So pass fail doesn't work, but this is really good. And it tells you what the customer wants. The customer wants zero. So of course you're driving that defects per unit down to the lowest that you can get it, down towards zero, okay? So they're sort of the KPIs that you could be using. Now in low volume, here's my recommendation. It's mean time to failure. So let's talk about mean time to failure replacing this thing, because this would be the, the traditional in-factory KPI. What's my defect rate? Now this works well in volume, but not in low volume. So let's talk about what will happen if you use this in low volume. Now let's say you only make, let's give a nice round number. You only make 100 units per year and you have a 1% defect rate, okay? If I plot a graph of defects, what's my graph gonna look like? Well, it's gonna look like this, isn't it? Most of the time, it's gonna look like zero. Then every now and again, I'll get one. I'll plot that on the, the graph then. I go again, possibly most of the year, and I see nothing then I get one, yeah. And the graph's going to look like that. And of course the problem with that, and of course, and turning it into a percent defect rate, is of course, whilst you might have on average a 1% defect rate, that doesn't mean every year you'll get exactly one defect. Sometimes they could happen after 10 months. If we get two defects in a year, it looks like you've got a 2% defect right now. Then you might get a period of a year with no defects in it at all. So one year you're at 2%, the next year you're at 0%. And you think, depends which way the results come at you, you might think you're getting really much better, you might think you're getting really worse. And I would say to you, there's a good chance neither of those two statements are true because at low numbers, this system which if I put it down as a um, probability distribution is the binomial distribution, pass fail. It's the binomial distribution. Now, binomial data hates low numbers. It just can't see what's going on. So if defects become rare and therefore become low volume or your manufacturing is rare and is low volume, and by nature, your defects are also very rare. A better graph is mean time to failure. Now what mean time to failure does is measure the gap. It counts the gap. Now you can count the gap in two ways. You could count pieces. You could count work days. Either of those two work very well. Doesn't matter which one you use, to be honest. Whichever one works the, the best is the, is the advice. Um, if you are making a very even production rate, so for instance, if every day you completed a unit, bang, 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 220 units a year, you know, and that's very, very consistent production, then of course you could count pieces or you could count work days and both of those graphs would show you the same thing. But if you had a tendency to finish 20, then finish five, then finish one, then finish 15, then finish three, and the production's not consistent, then work days is gonna look odd. It's not gonna work properly, and therefore you should count the pieces between each failure. Count the pieces between each mistake. Now obviously what this does is create a different graph. Let's say you're sitting up around, let's say 10 pieces. 
in between each mistake. So what you'd see now is effectively it's a run chart. So let's say this is what your mean time to failure graph looks like. Now the way I've drawn it, I was hoping to draw it so that it was stable. I look at the average there, but I have to say my last few data points, look, my graph's going up. Potentially, that's telling, we, telling me we're beginning to improve. Now obviously you could see the opposite of this, but the graph starts to come down. And we're beginning to, uh, without the control, we're beginning to deteriorate, we're beginning to get the, the rejects coming at us much closer. Now, this deterioration, you will see this much quicker than these little blobs here getting closer together. These could be coming closer together and there's a good chance you'd never see it on your normal pass-fail type graphs. Whereas the mean time to failure graph starts to see the change much quicker. Now this is, the mean time to failure is a different distribution. It's got an arrival rate, which is known as the Poisson distribution. This is also the Poisson distribution. Defects per unit is also the Poisson distribution. It's got an arrival rate. There is a speed that the defects are coming at us naturally. And it is much more sensitive, but also much more stable. It's not gonna make you overreact. If two defects appear within the same one year window, because you're plotting mean time to failure, it's not gonna make you think you're dramatically getting worse. Or the opposite, where you get no defects and you think you're dramatically better. It's gonna make you calm down and react to the defects in a much more stable way. So there are a number of KPIs you could use, and I dare say people will drop comments in the video, and please do that if you can think of a thousand and one other KPIs that you could use. But this one was specifically about low volume. Uh, someone wanted a little bit of advice about that, and the best one for me is mean time to failure. The other beauty of this, of course, is if you don't get a failure, you don't have to plot the graph. So you're not working hard, plotting a graph like this when nothing's happening. Why would I keep chasing something when nothing's showing up on the graph? Um, so it's a much more efficient graph. It shows the results uh, much better and works brilliant in low volume situations. And one last example for you, of course, is your safety data. If I go into most companies now, often in reception, there is a little ticker that says the number of days since the last accident. That's mean term to failure. Once upon a time, back 100 years ago, probably we would have had accidents every day in, in, our, in British industry. And therefore we would have counted the accidents. So we would have counted, it would have been pass fail. We would have counted the number of accidents per day in that sense. And we would have kind of plotted a graph um, as, a, as a count, like we're plotting a graph here as one defect, yeah, it'd be a count. Um, but eventually we got so good at safety that the events got rare. So we don't bother trying to count the event because you just say zero for yesterday, zero for the day before, zero for the day before. What we do now is we say it's been 232 days since the last reportable accident. And what we're doing is measuring the gap. We've changed to mean time to failure. And that's the perfect measure when the events get rare. Yeah, so you know, defect rate and defects per million, brilliant for high volume situations. But when the defects get rare, by the way, even in a high volume company, if your defect rate goes so rare that you're plotting zeros, you need to change to mean time to failure to be able to judge what's going on, to be able to see improvement, to be able to see deterioration, or to be able to see stability. That graph is gonna be a much more stable piece of information for you to look at. You will act and react in a much more stable way and therefore you won't waste effort and ultimately you'll make more money. Use mean time to failure when your defect rate is very, very low.